Well, I'm going to ask you again, have you heard them? Have you been listening for them? They're everywhere. The bells. They're everywhere. And my prayer for myself and for you is as we encounter these folks ringing these bells at this season of the year, most, the vast majority of the experience you'll have is with folks raising for money for a very worthy cause. The Salvation Army helps a lot of people. But that those bells will trigger in your mind this picture we want you to get in this season of the year. We introduced it to you last year, January 1st. 2017. It wasn't a clever idea. When I, when I read the book, Surprise the World, it uh, rocked me back on my heels. I knew I wanted to be such a person. I want you to be such people. And so we're doing this series throughout the month of, November, of December, Hear the Bells Ringing. The bells standing, remember, for, uh, well, you'll see a slide on this in a moment, for, for bless. We looked at that last week. Jesus went about doing good. For eat, that is eating with others. Uh, listen, listen to the Spirit. Be sensitive. Don't let the noise of life drown out the Spirit's communication with you. Learn. Live every day learning to be more like Jesus Christ. Let's look at these passages during this, this season. I want you to ask yourself, do I look like that? And then sent. To live sent. God sent Jesus. Jesus said, so send I you. And so we're looking today at this E portion of this acrostic bells. I want to ask you to turn with me, if you would, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 7. Verses 31 to 35. Stand with me. Uh, find that in your Bible. If you don't have your Bible with you, we're going to put the text on the screen for you. Follow along as I read. Think about the generation we live in, how fickle it is. And hear Jesus' words. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They're like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. Now what in the world does he mean by that? Well, he's gonna tell us. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine. He was, he was an ascetic, he was part of the Essenes. And you say he has a demon. Such conduct's gotta be demon inspired. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her children. This is what, it's the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord show us today that the Son of God came to earth he had no place to lay his head. He said, foxes have holes they can live in. Birds have nests they can live in. The Son of Man has no place to pillow his head, a place that he could call home because he wasn't home. And yet, arguably, no one used a meal more redemptively than Jesus. May God help us to be like him. Thank you. Please be seated. I said to you earlier, when I was reading some material, getting ready for this message, I came across a fellow, Jesus ate his way through the Gospels. And then he asked, he says, have you eaten with a tax collector lately? And when you read the four Gospels, and it'd be impossible today with the time we have to do a survey even of all the people Jesus ate with, but when you read them, meals feature prominently in Jesus' ministry. Now, Parenthetically, when we talk about being like Jesus, impacting this culture by some habits we cultivate, we already have the habit of eating. Unless you're fasting on a diet, 
You're doing this three times a day. Some of us maybe more. Food's always on children's mind. I'm hungry. You couldn't be hungry. You just can I have a snack. Oh, what what Lord of the Rings taught us is second breakfast. I'm hungry. So food is not an, an abstract, hypothetical idea. And you won't hear any person breathing on the planet who says, I'm really not into food. One friend of mine said to me one time, I think he was trying to shame me, he said, I, I eat to live. I don't live to eat. And he raised his eyebrows when he said that. And all of us fall somewhere in between that. Eat to live and live to eat. And Jesus used meals, perhaps as much as anybody, to advance his mission and his ministry. And think about this. He did this without a house. He couldn't invite anybody to his home. I mean, in fact, the startling thing when you read is he has been known, Zacchaeus would tell you this, to invite himself to your home. Let's just look at some things for a few minutes today and ask yourself as we're reading this, am I even remotely interested in manifesting the hospi hospitable heart that my Savior did? His overcoming barrier after barrier because he didn't have a place to pillow his head. He didn't have a base of operation, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe Peter's mother-in-law's house, maybe the upper room where John uh, had access, maybe, maybe the home of Lazarus, but nothing on this earth that he could call home, and yet it didn't stand in his way of showing Christian hospitality as a means to advance his agenda in making disciple makers. He, uh, just think about some of the meals. In the upper room, Passover. He celebrated probably four Passovers, depending on the chronology he put together of his ministry. Four Passovers with the disciples, the last one being the most incredible. Because he basically inaugurated the new covenant in anticipation of what was going to happen in his trials. One writer said, they killed Jesus because of the way he ate. Because he ate and drank with sinners. That's an interesting, I asked you last week, what would you like on your epitaph? epitaph? And one of the things that Jesus went about, he went about doing good. I thought that'd be a great. What about this? This folk person associated with sinners. This is one of the mistakes of the Pharisees. In fact, they're the ones that accused him of this. This man, this man, he's with sinners. If he, if he was really a prophet, he would know what these people are like. I mean, we, we can see, just observe what they're like. And Jesus is supposed to know the hearts, and he had demonstrated several times that he did when he would, when he would speak out loud their thoughts. If this man were really a prophet, he would know what these folks are like, and he'd have nothing to do with them because they are sinners. And that was their huge mistake because they thought they could actually sit down for a meal and leave sinners out when they themselves were sinners. So that was his charge. He was on the side of a mountain. We, we call it the feeding of the 5,000, and then a few days later, the feeding of the 4,000. But I would remind you, those were 5,000 men, and we know that there was at least at least one child there because that's what Jesus used the lunch of the child to feed that crowd. I, I would suggest to you there was probably anywhere from 10, 15, 20, 25,000 people. It was 5,000 men. It wasn't a promise keepers rally. There were family units there. 
He fed them. He showed concern for them. Fed them again, trying to teach his disciples. If you give what you have to Jesus, it's always more than enough. He spoke in that last Passover slash New Covenant meal that he would not eat again until he gathered them together at that marriage supper of the Lamb, we call it. Remarkable. It's as if Jesus used the opportunity to eat as an object lesson for his followers to have the opportunity to serve, to minister, to bless. Probably, I don't know this, I, I haven't peeked through any windows, but many of the houses decorated for the season. Spent some time doing that, outside, inside perhaps. Or you have plans to do that if you haven't done it yet. Wouldn't it be a shame if we go to all that trouble and don't find the time to invite others in? Back here and I were talking about this the other day. And, uh, go ahead and save the date. You'll get, you'll get a notice on this in the bulletin next week. But, but Tuesday, the 19th of December, we want to invite all of you over uh, for, a, for, for somewhere between six and nine to come by in an open house just to, just to share the spirit of this season, the fellowship of the season. Uh, because we want to, because we love you, and, and because we want to be like Jesus. Jesus ate with those who were shunned, the outcasts. modeling that his ministry was redemptive. One writer said, we ate our way out of paradise. Think about that. Our first parents ate the forbidden fruit and it got them expelled and had comp implications for us. Can we eat our way into heaven? You can't get to heaven by eating, of course, but the point he's making, he says, Adam, the first Adam died for eating the forbidden fruit. The second Adam died that whosoever eats his flesh and drinks his blood shall attain eternal life. One writer said, table fellowship defines Jesus' communality, the idea that we're a community. That's why some people call this communion. One fellow suggested that the gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is framed around meal settings. Just read it sometime. Read, read through them and just have with those kind of lenses at the meals. Lessons taught in each meal and lessons taught to us by each meal. He turns each eating controversy into a teaching opportunity. After the first four chapters of Luke's gospel, Luke then becomes a narrative of Jesus' meals. In Luke 5, he eats with tax collectors and sinners. Luke 7, he eats at the home of Simon the Pharisee, is anointed by a sinner. Luke 9, he, he feeds the multitude. Luke 10, he eats at the home of Martha and Mary. Luke 11, eats a meal with Pharisees. Luke 14, he teaches the need to invite those who cannot invite us back. Luke 19, he eats in Zacchaeus' home. Luke 22, the Last Supper. Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus, he, he breaks bread with those two sad, uh, grieving disciples. And he has another meal in Jerusalem. Of course, on the seaside, the disciples come back from fishing and Jesus has a meal for them. He identified himself in the text we're reading today that the Son of Man came eating and drinking. See, we know from Luke 19.10, when he closes out his meal with Zacchaeus, that the 
Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. You, you're hearing purpose statements. Why did you come? To seek and to save what was lost. Mark 10, 45, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. And in our text today, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. He gives us no less than three descriptions of why he came. Because Jesus, who knows all, knows the power of table fellowship. We believe we're, we're striving to follow the New Testament model in the book of Acts by having the Lord's Supper together and then a fellowship meal following that. That's what the New Testament church did. It's a time for table fellowship. It's an opportunity when you have come to gather here to be sure you hang around long enough to sit across from people and eat. And I think it's really maximized. I'm, I'm not, you'll never see me going in and breaking up who's at the table saying, no, you've been at this table for no, no. But I think it's maximized when you purpose to say, I'm gonna eat. I haven't, I haven't eaten with those folks. What a great opportunity to get to know them. And you mix it up. Because it's, a, it's an attempt at Christian hospitality. And ideally, hopefully, it doesn't become the end in itself. It feeds into other opportunities. When, you, when I feed my family, I'm not, that's not, I mean, that's good. We should do that. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about inviting others into our atmosphere, saying that we value them. We value them. And Jesus did that at great risk. I want you to, let's look at some passages real quickly in the time we have left. Look at Luke chapter 11. This is, this is one of two, Luke 11, 37 to 54. One of two very uncomfortable meals that Jesus had when he was invited to go to the home of a Pharisee. In Luke eleven thirty-seven, 37, while Jesus was, was speaking, a Pharisee asked him, well, come down, come down with us. So he went and reclined at table First of all, the Pharisee was offended. They didn't, he didn't wash uh, before dinner. Now, Jesus was not, didn't have poor hygiene. They're talking about here washing, washing the feet. He'd come, he'd come in off the, off the dusty way. And then Jesus knew what he was going to say, and so he seizes the opportunity. He says, now you Pharisees, clean, cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. You fools. Now, at some point you, you think maybe this fellow's kind of regretful that he invited Jesus to dine. You fools, did you not, did he, not he who made the outside make the inside all? Give, give alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. Start from, work from the inside out, in other words, what Paul says, Romans 12. Be not conformed, be transformed. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and, and rue and every herb and neglect the justice and love of God. You ought to have done the other, but you shouldn't let leave the other, this, this one out. And so you see, he's teaching them how to live, what kingdom life looks like. And then he pronounces these woes. Woe to you, Pharisees. You love the best seat in the synagogues, the marketplaces. Woe to you. you you're like unmarked graves. People walk over them without knowing it. Then there was a lawyer who was invited there. Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. Jesus said, oh, I didn't mean to leave you out. Woe to you, lawyers, for you load people with burdens hard to bear. You yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your fathers killed. Woe, your witnesses, you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. I tell you, it will be required of this generation. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hinder those who were entering. And he went away from there, and the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. Uncomfortable, yet he used the opportunity to speak the truth. Luke 14, 1 to 24, another. There was a Sabbath to dine at the house of one of the, a ruler of one of the Pharisees. 
They were watching him carefully. So you get the sense that these invitations to come to their home and eat were, were traps. They didn't really want to know him better. I mean, the first thing out of the, in the last batch is he's offended that he didn't clean himself up. There was a man before him who had dropsy, and Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? So he's been invited over to what you and I would call Sunday meal. They were silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And they, he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that's fallen into the, a well on the Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? They could not reply to these things. There, there's, a, there's a painful silence. And now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor. He said, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And you'll begin with shame to take the lowest place. When you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and be repaid. And when you give a feast, invite the poor, the cripple, the lame, the blind. You'll be blessed because they cannot repay you. He teaches that the blessing in table fellowship is to minister to someone and not expect a reciprocal invite. We, uh, I can't go into that story. It'll take too long. But fascinating how some people look at things when they invite you over to eat. You'll be repaid at the resurrection. So one of those at the table wanted to change the topic. <laughs> when, how would you like to invite Jesus to eat, knowing he knows everything and that he's, he fears not the face of man. He will speak honestly to you, tenderly but honestly. Blessed is everyone who will eat the kingdom of, bread of the kingdom of God. He's, Jesus said, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many Time for the banquet, he sent his servants to say to those who had been invited, come, everything's ready. And they all alike began to make excuses. Well, I've got to, I bought a field, uh, got to go check on it. Uh, another said, I've got five yoke of oxen, I've got to examine them, make sure they're okay. One uh, other said, I've married a wife and can't come. The servant came and reported these things. The master of the house said, okay, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, sir, what, what you commanded has been done and still there's room. The master said to the servant, then go out to the highways and hedges, compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. And he's challenging them in terms of how they have rejected his ministry. And they think that they're going to eat bread in the kingdom. And then, of course, Zacchaeus. You know, children, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way and looked up in the tree, he said, Zacchaeus, come down, for I'm going to your house today. We used to sing that when I was growing up. And he did. He looked up, Luke 19, 10, 1, 1 through 10. Verse 5, hurry down, Zacchaeus. I must stay at your house today. How would you like that? Jesus says, I'm coming over to eat. Well, I, I hadn't cleaned up. I hadn't picked up. I, hadn't, I don't know if I've even got enough to feed him up. I mean, can you imagine? Just think about this. These are real experiences. The panic that would set in, which just exposes how oftentimes we miss, we miss the poor, important things. The opportunity for fellowship with the Lord. So he, those who saw it grumbled and said, he's gone to eat the guest of a man who's a sinner. Well, Zacchaeus had a life-changing encounter when Jesus invited himself to be a guest in his home. He stood up wanting to repay for his extortion, for his criminality under the guise of collecting taxes. Jesus' response was, today salvation has come to this house. Well, we could go on and on. Time does not allow us, but I, want to, I just want to challenge you in this season. If I ask a show of hands, who here would like to be more like Jesus? Anyone who follows Jesus Christ, even some who don't follow him, would say, well, I, I want to be more like Jesus. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And he was accused falsely for that. And here's a path. It doesn't take Bible school training. It doesn't take mastering the 
Hebrew of the Old Testament, the Greek of the New Testament. It just takes time. It takes inconvenience. It's the opportunity to invite someone into your sphere, into your home, and sit at table, and then seize the opportunity to live a questionable life before them, a life that they would say, tell me why. Why? Why'd you do this? Why is it that with all that's going around us that you seem to have hope? Why is that? And he'd be ready to speak a word, give an answer. The Son of God who came to earth as Bethlehem's babe, out of his own mouth said he came eating and drinking. As soon as he was old enough to go out on his own, this is what marked him. The meals of Jesus in the Gospels rival the teaching times of Jesus, those, those intentional large experiences on mountainsides by the sea. The meals of Jesus in the Gospels rival the miracles Jesus performed. In fact, he performed his first miracle at a wedding where they ran out of wine. I challenge myself. I challenge you. It's a habit. Eating's not a habit. We do that already. I mean, we've already got that down. God's wired us, wired me at least, that my tummy starts rumbling when there's not regular input. It's almost like a holy reminder. And rather than think, have I eaten? I want, to, I want to learn to think, have I thought about inviting someone into the sphere of a meal that I might bless them, that I might tell them that's what my Savior's like, encourage them so they don't feel lonely, they don't feel left out, they don't feel neglected, they don't feel worthless. May God give us in this season, which Norman said, Joshua said, offers so many opportunities to just commit to cultivate the habit to work these things into the flow of what we're already doing. And if you're here today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, I want you to know that Jesus says, come to me, eat my flesh, drink my blood. In other words, take me into you and you will have life. You will have life. And that's my, that's my desire. I, the celebration of Jesus' birth, we sing one of the hymns, Be Born in Us Today. My heart's desire before God is that Jesus Christ, God's only Son who lived a perfect life, kept the whole law so that you wouldn't have to spend eternity paying for your being a lawbreaker. That he will be born in you this season. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we, we read the life of our Savior, and I've got to confess to you, Lord, it's, it's humbling, it's convicting. We repent of the privatization of life in America. We repent. We build barriers. Keep people out. Make them feel like they're not welcome. Oh God. Help us to follow not, not the culture we've grown up in, not the culture around us. Help us to follow the example of Jesus. And welcome people to the table to share the glorious good news of a Savior who lived and died and rose again. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.